Good evening, all. I'd like to welcome you to the Village Council meeting of Monday, October 25th. Village Court, please call. Commissioner Reed. Present. Commissioner Lewis Walter. Present. Here. Here. Let's all stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. You have in your packets the draft of minutes from our previous meeting on September 13th, 2021. Any questions, comments, or suggestions? If not, I see the motion to approve the minutes at this time. So moved. Second. keeping the general ledger clean and making sure that all the checks and balances are in place. So thank you very much, Alan. There are three pieces of required communication that we issue as part of the audit process. Uh, the first that I'm gonna cover here this evening is actually not in front of you. It's a paper copy that you can obtain from Alan and it's also in electronic format in your board documents. So um, that is what we call our SAS 114 letter. In accordance with statement on auditing standard number 114, we're required to disclose whether or not we had any disagreements or difficulties during our audit process, and I'm very happy to report that there were no such disagreements noted within the body of that letter. Uh, next, if I can please have you turn to page nine of the Comprehensive Annual Financial Report. That is the thicker of the two bound documents that you have in front of you here tonight. On page nine, you should find what uh, appears to be an award, and that is certainly what this is. Uh, the village was the recipient of the Certificate of Achievement Award for fiscal year ended uh, April 30th, 2020, and we'll be working hand in hand to apply for the fiscal year 2021 report as well. Uh, so congratulations. Really, this represents the highest form of financial reporting excellence that any governmental entity can receive in the governmental uh, accounting world. So um, there's a couple different components within the audit report that differ from a standard audit report. Uh, certainly a time burden placed on staff, uh, as I'm sure Alan can attest, uh, to meet the compliance requirements of that program. So congratulations. Uh, turning to page 10, you should find our lot of name and letterhead there. This is our independent auditor's report. So in addition to stating your responsibility as management of the village, which is ultimately to prepare and provide us a set of clean financial statements to work off of, we go on in our opinions paragraph to issue an unmodified opinion for fiscal year 2021, uh, which once again, cleanest form of opinion that any entity can receive in the governmental accounting world, uh, and ultimately states that we believe as your auditors that the financial statements are presented fairly and that there are sound internal controls in place. I want to point out one very important section to you as a board, and that's, that can be found on pages 12 through 23. We as your audit firm are certainly uh, no strangers to um, some of the gla glazed over looks that we get as we look at our financial statements sometimes. So uh, I certainly want to point out our MD&A section here as it provides a great narrative analysis of a lot of the highlights for fiscal year 2021. Um, it's got comparative data, charts, graphs, et cetera, and will really give you a great bird's eye view of fiscal year 2021 as a whole. 
And lastly, uh, we've issued a management letter, which is the second bound document that is in front of you. The primary purpose of our management letter is to convey any internal control recommendations that we've identified, any best practices in the industry, as well as any, um, in general, more so transparency type issues that we would like the board to be made aware of. Um, I'm very happy to report the one current recommendation that we had this year was simply an upcoming accounting pronouncement. So nothing that you as a board need to take action on. Um, this is GASB 87, which is going to change the accounting for leases throughout the audit report. Uh, this does not go into effect until fiscal year 2023. So again, this comment is simply included to provide some transparency of future updates to your audit report uh, in 2023. There are a few prior recommendations that we've got in the body of uh, this letter as well, so I would encourage you to read through those. Um, we do include a status paragraph on each of those comments that will allow you to see whether or not that comment has been implemented, repeated, or removed entirely. That concludes my brief recap of the audit. I would be happy to field any questions that you might have. None. I thank you very much for the opportunity to share. Well done, lad. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate thank you. it. Everybody, stay safe. Thank you. So, any action that we need to take? That's just a presentation. We don't need to take any vote to accept it. Uh, second item here. Or is to proclaim the month of October as the Domestic Violence Awareness Month. The proclamation states that to raise awareness of domestic violence in the village of Hales Park stands with Pillars Community Health's message that hashtag love starts at home and that there's no place in our village for domestic violence. Consent agenda. All items on the consent agenda are routine or have been brought forward at the direction of the Board of Commissioners and will be enacted motion. If discussion is desired, that item will be approved in the consent agenda item A to approve resolution 2021 R07, a resolution endorsing the 2021 action plan for the Chicago region. The resolution states that the village of Palos Park supports goals and objectives of the 2021 climate action plan for the Chicago region and pledges to take strategic action to achieve these goals for a more resilient, equitable, and healthy future. I am being to approve resolution 2021-8, resolution acknowledging the participation and completion of the Comrade Green Region Program for the Village of Hales Park Pollinator Garden Project. The resolution states that those of Hales Park participated in the Comrade Green Region Program to create the pollinator, uh, pollinator garden and the village committed to equal part cash requirements of up to $5,000. I don't see. To approve the interim intergovernmental agreement between the Bullish Hill Park and the Department of Health for the provision of environmental health inspections for the Hill Park Park Time Inspection for the time period of December 1st, 2021 to November 30th, 2022 at a cost of $100 per inspection. To ratify payment of invoices on the warm list dated September 27, 2021, in the amount of $53,255.06. Item E, to ratify payment of invoices on the warm list dated October 11, 2021, in the amount of $139,093.81. Item F, to ratify the supplemental warm list dated October 11, 2021, <coughs> annual checks, payroll, recurring wire transfers. Uh, $417,281.81. And finally, G to approve payment of invoices on the warrant list dated October 25th, 2021, and the amount of $25,624. I have a motion to approve the consent agenda at this time. So, I'll second. Hearing a motion and a second, will the clerk please call the roll? Yes. Commissioner Yes. Commissioner Yes. Yes. Yes, and motion carries. Any items of old business be brought before the council at this time? Information and updates, public works and streets, recreation report, Commissioner Novich Walters. Thank you, 
David Mahoney. I just have one item on the agenda. It's regarding our MFT pavement program. On August 9th of 21, the Village Council awarded the 2022 MFT project to Lindahl Brothers in the amount of $728,235 with authority to the Village Engineer to spend up to $800,000. We have our first pay estimate in the amount of $80,084.26. We're asking for approval of this pay estimate. This amount covers all work done to date, but withholds 10% as retention. Thank you. Any questions? Now I'd like to make a motion to approve the pay estimate number one for the 2022 MFT Pavement Improvement Project to Lindahl Brothers Incorporated in the amount of $80,000 $80,084.26. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any other questions? If not, um, let's put it to the floor. Commissioner Holder Yes. Commissioner Yes. 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 Motion occurs. And then just to let everyone know to put on their calendars, just want to confirm the date. We will be doing our annual. Um, holiday tree lighting on Thursday, December 2nd. Mm -hmm. uh, so keep a lookout for posts on Facebook, Instagram, on our signage outside, in your email blast that you get, but that'll be coming up and we would like everyone to attend. And that concludes my report. <coughs> Commissioner Reed, building a public property. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. First of all, I'd like to say it's an honor, a pleasure, and a privilege to be back amongst you in person. Yay. I missed you. I'm back for a little while. We'll see. Now, more important matters. The only department report for tonight on October 25th. As the leaves change and the days get shorter, take the time to prepare for the oncoming cold weather. Change your furnace filter schedule, excuse me, change your furnace filters. Schedule a chimney sweep. Replace batteries and smoke detectors. <coughs> Test your emergency backup generator. Inspect and clean your gutters. Rake your leaves and disconnect your garden hoses. 38 inspections were completed to the time period of September the 8th through October the 19th, resulting in $20,697.49 in coverage fees. Fiscal year to date, we have accrued $173,965.45. And that concludes my Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Paul, 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 the safety report. Thank you, Mayor Mahoney. So I present uh, for your interest the police activity report from the 13th of September through October 24th, so roughly a little bit more than five weeks, five and a half weeks. 5,218 calls for service. This, that's about what we've been looking at for the last 18 months or so, about a thousand calls for service a week. Uh, uh, issued 80 adjudication tickets, an additional 31 traffic tickets, 33 written warnings, and an additional 42 verbal warnings. Took 54 additional case reports, 26 accident reports, arrested five adults. No juvenile arrests, impounded four vehicles, and performed 37 senior checks, as well as an additional 66 citizen assists. So that is what the Pettis Park Police Department's been up to. Uh, then a couple of quick uh, announcements. <coughs> um, the first is uh, Halloween is coming. It's on a weekend this year, so uh, the 31st falls on a weekend. Uh, but we've never really set Halloween trick-or-treating hours for the village, nor do I intend to today. Um, uh, we'd ask that if you don't want to participate as a homeowner or as a tenant in uh, trick-or-treating, certainly that's your prerogative, leave your porch lights off. Um, our suggested hours are somewhere at 
would normally be after school hours, but since it's on the weekend, there is no school. Um, uh, so again, uh, we'll leave it to your family's discretion. You want to trick or treat in the afternoon, have a great time. Uh, generally, we uh, not like to see a lot of people out after it gets really dark, which is usually somewhere sunsets a little after six these days, so 6.30, quarter to seven. Just because uh, you may have noticed the paucity of street lights that there are in Pales <laughs> Park. Uh, and again, if you're going to be out trick-or-treating after dark, uh, respect the fact that it can be hard to see the people that you're with. So know your routes, uh, make sure that you have something reflective. And speaking of reflective, the Pales Park Police Department has at no charge to anyone who comes and gets one, a trick-or-treat bag, which are, I'm told, reflective. But in the light, they look pretty just orange and black. Um, uh, so you can stop by during normal, uh, during normal business hours to the capture center where the police department is located and we'll give you virtually as many bags as you ask for, as long as it's in single digits. Um, uh, and uh, those are provided to you through the courtesy of the Palos Park Police Department. Um, some other thoughts from the police department about trick-or-treating. If your child's going to wear a mask, it's useful if they can actually see out of it. Um, uh, so. Those are good things to check ahead of time. Uh, glow sticks, flashlights if they're trick-or-treating after dark. Um, uh, no unwrapped candy, please. Um, so if you are the parent who sorts through to remove those vicious Snickers bars, which are a danger to anyone besides an adult, um, uh, then uh, make sure that you've gone through their candy. We've not had issues with candy in the park, but um, the days of homemade treats issued for Halloween are long gone. So again, um, just be aware that that's coming up and uh, act accordingly. Careful of the kids out there. And then perhaps a, a more important announcement, but just as, uh, just as important to the village, uh, I want to just call your attention to the Palos Park Police Foundation. This is a nonprofit local institution that was founded years ago to try and help uh, the Palos Park Police Department um, afford the things that uh, otherwise are difficult to be able to pay for. So I'll give you a couple examples. When we get a new squad car, or when we get a used squad car that we have to outfit to Palos Park standards, it's about another $12,000 on top of the cost of that car. So while I try and budget for those every year, sometimes those costs can be difficult. We've tried to put lots of uh, electronic communication equipment in the cars. I've never seen anybody write anyone a uh, ticket or uh, solve a crime by sitting in the office here. So we try and keep our officers out on the street. One way that they can do that is now all of their reports, generally 90% of their paperwork can all be completed while they're on patrol. So um, uh, that kind of technology is generally unfunded and relatively expensive. So we use the foundation a lot. We also use the foundation for emergency issues. A year or so ago, our intoximeter, which is the machine that one blows into when one is suspected of driving while impaired under the influence of alcohol, died. And uh, I did not have a budget item to replace that, and the Palos Park Police Foundation allowed us to be able to go out and emergently purchase another intoximeter so that we could continue to keep the streets, the streets safe for the rest of us. So you may have already seen the uh, annual letter that comes out from the Palos Park Police Foundation. That's uh, giving you some history and some of the applications that we use the money for. And if you're looking to support the police, found, the police department here in Palos Park, and you're of the inclination to support them with some uh, financial support, that would be as good a place to be able to do that as any. We don't accept money while we're on the street. Although, quite oddly, we get offered it not because someone's trying to get out of the ticket or something, but someone has appreciation for what it is that we did. So, Palos Park Police Foundation, uh, you can find a link to the foundation on the Palos Park website. Um, uh, and if you have any other questions, you can drop me an email. D-P-O-L-K-A, D-Polk at palespark.org. So uh, just a quick plug for the Palos Park Police Foundation. October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month. It's almost done. Uh, the color pink is a prominent feature of the campaign. 
And many of you have commented on the fact that our Palos Park Police Department has been wearing their pink patches. Uh, so I thank uh, the people who supported us to be able to manufacture those and put those on the uniforms. Um, and uh, we've been affected personally in the department as well as in the village uh, by people who've had their lives uh, altered by the uh, occurrence of uh, breast cancer. And I appreciate the fact that uh, our rank and file were able to uh, participate in Breast Awareness Month with their new patches. And then I'll close with a uh, somewhat more fun activity. We do a lot of uh, interactions with citizens to try and, have, and develop a relationship between the police department and the citizens of the park that doesn't just occur as a function of someone doing something wrong or running afoul of the law. Um, so you've seen multiple, we have multiple social interactions with coffee with the cop and uh, coffee with the chief and we have our own citizens on patrol program. But we, uh, someone suggested that we involve the children. And so we ran a coloring contest for the children of Palos Park ages 12 and under. And we challenged them to color a picture which showed a Palos Park police car. And uh, we actually gave them some outlines for things to uh, inspire them. So I'm going to show you a couple of these. Uh, all of these children have currently been acknowledged. Uh, but, I have to show you my favorite one. <laughs> Hands drawn, thank you for keeping us safe. So, uh, if you haven't gotten your acknowledgement for your child's participation, either you submitted it anonymously, or uh, you haven't seen it yet because it's, they just went out this week. So, again, thanks everybody who participated. Uh, the chief is actually on patrol this evening. So he's not able to uh, join us. And uh, no further ado, that concludes our report. Thank you, Commissioner. <coughs> Call some finances. We have no report this evening. So it's my report. I have an uh, agenda item. The agenda matter is consideration of an ordinance in Part 6, Chapter 698. Part 8, Title 2, Chapter 804, and 808 of the PLS Park Code, and regard to the video game. Several businesses who hold, uh, which hold uh, village like license have inquired over the past several years about being permitted to be licensed to have video gaming terminals on their premises. The current village code, Chapter 698, prohibits video gaming. The Village Council adopted Ordinance 2010-01 on January 11, 2010 to ban video gaming in Palos Park. The Illinois Gaming Act, as found in 230 ILCS 40-1, enacted the Public Act 96-34 on July 13, 2009, allows for video gaming in the state of Illinois. In 2010, many of the communities surrounding Palos Park opted out of video gaming podcasting ordinances like the one adopted by the Pales Park Village Council. Today, only the neighboring community of Pales Heights still prohibits video gaming. The draft ordinance before the Village Council would repeal Chapter 698 of the Village Code and, new sec and add new sections to Chapters 804 and 808. The ordinance, if approved, would create the ability for Pales Park to Class A consumption on the premises five licenses uh, and class <coughs> consumption promises is a golf course, one license, uh, liquor license holders, the ability to apply for a video gaming license. Each qualified applicant could apply to the village council for approval to create a video gaming license. At adoption, each category of video gaming license would be uh, zero. The draft ordinance would do the following things. Prohibit video game cafes where more than 49% of the residents would be from video game. Allow for the play of video games only during permitted hours of liquor sales. Uh, 
video gaming terminals would be in a segregated area uh, with a physical barrier and restricted to persons 21 years of age and older. Uh, they would allow for the total number of video gaming terminals per establishment at six, prohibit video gaming signage on the exterior of any establishment, uh, require video surveillance in the village gaming terminal area with, uh, with a minimum of 30 days of video recording storage. Uh, each approved establishment would be required to have a direct connect burglar alarm system to the village's police department. Uh, we annually assess a $25 per video terminal operated in the village of Pales Park in addition to the annual cost of work license and oil license. Staff has reviewed data from the only Department of Revenue for the municipal share of video gaming monies for the communities of also Crestwood, Lamont, Oak Forest, Portland Park, Pillows Hills, Willow Springs, and work for the period of 2000, January 2019 to August 2021. Uh, the average annual municipal distribution per establishment in these eight communities is about $16,893. The average number of video gaming establishments per community is 23. So uh, tonight, this evening, I, I am not asking for a motion to approve this ordinance uh, for the purpose of this meeting, in my view, uh, or this particular agenda item is to have some discussion about the ordinance, uh, determine whether this is something that uh, we need to consider. Adjustments uh, and to take any other kind of to see. Anyone like to add some thoughts? That I can start. Um, so, uh, th this is an issue. Point of view, 
so that we can have additional revenue. That is a side benefit. If it were only that issue, I would not entertain an ordinance of this nature. So I've got a few comments. Then if you want to chime in and discuss the gaming ordinance as well. I do also have, um, after we talk about the, the general comments, some information, comments that have been sent to me, things that you know I wanted to bring to the council's uh, consideration, uh, just some public input, some interesting ideas. Uh, but please feel free to chime in. Well. <coughs> Let me offer a couple of thoughts for your consideration. I did not come prepared this evening to address this matter. I'm trying to read the agenda. My assumption was that I would be contending generally until November the 8th. However, I have never been one to be bashful about opining on issues that are relevant to the residents of the Village of Park. Again, I was not elected to offer my personal opinion about what I think, all right? Do I have a personal opinion? Yeah. Is it relevant? Not as my position as an elected official. No, it's not. So the question arises, why would we do this? Well, there are a number of reasons for and reasons against. There are those who would say that a number of municipalities are opting to use this as a source of revenue. I have not seen any studies that said gaming revenues would be sufficient to account for the majority of the revenue stream of a municipality. Is there some money coming in? Probably, yeah. Is it a bunch? Who knows? Is it enough to carry? No. So we must ask the question, is this something that our businesses want? because they're residents. Is this something that our residential folks want, the folks that ain't in business? I don't know, they have to tell us. We have seen some comments on social media, pro and con. At the end of the day, we must ask ourselves a question. How are we, the village, going to sustain ourselves short term and long term? Game okay, isn't going to be it. Will it provide some source of revenue? Depends on how the folks are going to use it. I don't know. Is this a road we want to go down? Residents have to tell us. Some facts, though, are crystal clear. Number one, the village does not have a commercial base, a robust commercial base. Let me clarify. We cannot raise property taxes without village residents' approval. The last time I checked, businesses were not banging on the door to get into the park. We have to incentivize people. We want them to come here. How are we going to do that? I don't know. Is gaming going to be a part of that incentivizing? Could be. But you have to tell us. You elected us to be your mouthpiece. We don't want to make decisions on our own without your input. Sitting in your houses on your hands, don't give us direction. So we need you to tell us, what do you want us to do? Are we going to move forward? Or are we going to stand still? I don't know the answer. <coughs> Can gaming be a part of the equation? It could be. I don't know but you have to tell us. 
That's all we're asking. If you say yay, nay. If you say nay, give us some guidance. Don't leave us on an island to make this decision on our own. Unless that's what you want us to do. Your silence will let us know. That's all we've got. I'll let you play first. Okay. I don't have a, a, a lot to say because a lot of what you said is quite the sentiment that I hold. I, I think the biggest concern is that our existing establishments uh, are asking for this because of competition around them. And as you mentioned, we do not have a robust um, commercial district. And we rely on those revenues for a lot of things in the village. And if this keeps businesses from leaving our town, it's something to consider. Um, as far as how the ordinance was laid out with nothing on the outside of a building promoting that they have gambling and things like that, I'm a big fan of not advertising that those machines are inside. Um, but I would hate to see restaurants and bars, the couple that we have, leave our village. It's difficult enough to get businesses to put their businesses in Palos Park because we're surrounded by forest reserves. And big commercial chains decide that they want to you know how many people live within a five mile radius. Well, when forest preserves are between you and all the people, there aren't too many people that live in a five mile radius. Um, so it makes it challenging to bring businesses into the park. We are unique and I think we can keep it that way. Um, but this is something that we really need to um, look at carefully. And that's what I have. Largely agree with uh, what's been said by the commissioners that uh, spoke before me. One of the most difficult things, challenges I've found in the years that we've been graced with the ability to serve as your commissioners is trying to be careful about expressing our own opinions versus looking at what the collective best is for the village. And uh, I'll echo the sentiments that have already been stated. In the absence of any input, you get, you get my opinion, and I'm not sure that that's why anybody elected me personally. The, 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 the driving impetus for this does not come from a city council saying, hey, you know, we could uh, maybe build another seven feet of roads if we had uh, a couple thousand dollars coming from video game. It comes from businesses coming to us and saying, we've lost a competitive edge that has been magnified by the fact that people don't go to restaurants and bars the same way that they did two and a half years ago. And while the threat of, of leaving the park hasn't been stated, certainly the desire to have alternative income streams for those places has been. So, I mean, that's true. I'm not a fan of video gambling either. Um, uh, the thought of sharing my space with someone banging on a machine is not my idea of a good night out. So that sort of leaves me with two uh, roads to take. One is you don't go there. Um, and there are restaurants in the park that could conceivably start to participate in video gambling if indeed we uh, allowed it in the park that I would miss the opportunity to be able to go to. Um, or, or the second is you try and structure the ordinance in a way that the gambling can still occur, but it's not necessarily sharing the same place as my shrimp de jean. So um, uh, there have been lots of suggestions, some of which I'm sure the mayor will get to, about how to segregate the gambling and the, and the patrons who don't wish to participate in that. Um, uh, we don't allow a lot of advertising in the park as it is. I mean, if someone wanted to put something 
in their print media, we could talk through those kinds of things, but something that's visible from the street or the parking lot, I think is unacceptable. We don't allow those in storefronts as it is now. So I wouldn't see that as being any different. I think ultimately, if the decision is made against, then the businesses are going to have to decide how that affects them doing business going forward. I can also see a downside if we do enact an ordinance that allows it, where people may just vote with their feet and the businesses, whatever is offset by video gambling, is lost by the people who don't like video gambling. That's not a decision for me to make. That's not a decision for a council to make one way or the other. And I think that time and, and market pressure will, will sort of sort that stuff out as it becomes more apparent. I think tying it to a liquor license is a great way to be able to start. I, I laugh when I drive down Archer and see, you know, uh, uh, Dan Polk's donut and video gambling store. I mean, I, I, you know, if I'm going for donuts, the last thing I think I'm going to do is play a couple hands of blackjack. On the other hand, that place seems to be thriving. So, uh, you know, who am I to say that that's not a way to make a, a honest stop? I guess what I'm trying to say in the long run is the same thing that the two commissioners prior to me have echoed. If you don't tell us what you want, you're going to end up with what we want. And I don't know if that's necessarily the right way to go about it. And um, I, I think that we can structure an ordinance such that it's, it's, uh, it's not an in-your-face kind of activity. Um, and whatever we do is not permanently irrevocable. So if it needs to be massaged, or if it needs to be altered, or if it needs to be taken away or reinstituted, however we play that out, I mean, we can always revisit those things. We're revisiting the decision we made years ago. Um, but I'd encourage you, if you're in, within the sound of my voice or you're talking to somebody, reach out. Let us know. Actually, we'd like you to reach out anytime you have some issue that you want to talk about. We have social events in the village where you can talk to us easily. We have email. I answer my emails. So do the rest of the commissioners. We have telephone lines here at the village. You can give us a call and leave us a message and we'll get back to you. Uh, you can drop by and say hello, you know where I am. So again, this is one of those decisions where I can make an argument on both sides. And uh, if you want to end up with my opinion, don't tell me anything. If you'd rather have your opinion weigh in on this, let us know what you think. So that's all I got. Perfect. So, I just, uh, you know, as uh, you may know, I have um, posted several times on uh, social media uh, regarding the coming of the consideration of this ordinance. Uh, I've asked people to comment. I've received some comments. I just wanted to share a few things with, with you. Um, your consideration. Uh, someone suggested um, uh, concern about the signage uh, and uh, raised the question about, I understand no outside signs are permitted, but what about signs invisible, visible to the outside from the inside? Uh, that actually is a addressed in this version of the ordinance, is it doesn't just talk about signs on the outside, but it says any signs advertising video game in that are visible from the exterior of the establishment. So I think that issue is addressed. Um, there is a, a comment from one person who contacted me regarding the segregation of the gaming. And here, State ordinance basically says that gaming has to be segregated to prevent those under the age of 21 from entering the area. Um, for a, uh, a drinking or a bar establishment, that's the whole bar. So really there's no segregation required by the state ordinance from other patrons in the bar. And the question I have for, you, for your consideration is, do we want to further define this ordinance to create that segregation? Um, that's 
be answered, but just to be considered and, and thought about. Uh, that's you know something for our, our attorneys to to think about. You know what what's being done in other towns on that particular topic. Uh, it was a good question I had thought. Uh, one person asked whether this sh why shouldn't this go to a, a referendum. So I throw that question out there for you. Um, certainly makes it easier for me. If I don't have to make the decision. Um, but there are pros and cons of, of having a referendum. There's any other questions that I have or any other input that I received that I thought I might share tonight. But I appreciate you all uh, weighing in your thoughts um, and sure absolutely just based on what you just said that generated a question for me for the council does the state statute allow municipalities to impose restrictions that are greater than those that are set forth in the statute itself it does and it, does. it does it does the statute does require requirements as to how it has to be set aside and blocked off uh, and with the restriction. Uh, it also says that somebody of the age of 21 who is an employee in this establishment has to be able to view the entire area where the video gaming is taking place at all times so that there's an employee monitoring the space so that nobody under 21 actually goes into the space. So there are requirements on separation of the facility and monitoring the facility, but you can put additional requirements in there. I mean, one of them that the mayor touched upon was the, uh, or at least was in your ordinance, is the tape of a, you know, a video surveillance camera that has to be kept for 30 days where you can see who entered that. So you do have some flexibility in additional restrictions on the area. Okay. I don't want to belabor the point, but let me ask it a different way. As a general matter, did the General Assembly craft the statute such that municipalities can't go further than those restrictions imposed in the statute, not in any individual specific area of the statute, but as a global thing, can we go further or do we have to pick and choose the sections of the statute that will permit a municipality to go further than those that are imposed by the general no, The way you're doing it is you are doing it through your liquor licensing and you have wide discretion in liquor license regulations that apply to your various classes of liquor license. So while the statute has its own restrictions on video gaming, because in order to be, get a video gaming license, the state law requires that the establishment, other than a truck stop establishment, has to also sell liquor for consumption on the licensed premises, you have regulatory powers through liquor licensing. The way this current ordinance is set up, it's in your liquor code. Okay. So the liquor license, the liquor code gives us the authority to it. Okay, that's the yes. question I was asking. Thank you. I just didn't yes. ask it directly. That's how you get around it. Not around it, but that's how you get the and, regulations. And we, don't want to, we don't want to say around it. No, no, no. no, no. We don't want that's to say how you around. insure it. That's how you insure compliance. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. I'm here as the non lawyer. I have not heard. Thank you. All right. Um, so I would. Entertain a motion to table this to our next council. Continue it. Continue. So it doesn't have to be taken off the table. So, so moved. moved. Second. So we uh, have a motion to continue this matter to our next meeting, which is Madam Village Manager Bay, November 8th. November 8th. November 8th. Yeah. Uh, so to November 8th. Uh, Motion and a second. Will the clerk please Yes. 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 Thank you all. Um, 
I just had one other item I wanted to comment on, and that was our um, accord um, gallery had a uh, fundraiser this weekend on Saturday. Uh, it was an immersive uh, Spanish culinary and dance experience. I attended with my wife Raw. It was really a, a nice event. Uh, they had Chef Charles, who is a well-known chef in Spain, traveled to the Chicago area, with which he has some connection um, to uh, serve as our chef. We had uh, uh, some dance performances. A really, really nice event, and I just wanted to applaud all the folks at the court for uh, uh, a, an event well done. Clerk, there are moments. Do you have anything else? Thank you. I'm not sure about anything. I have one item for the council's consideration, uh, that being a resolution uh, requesting and authorizing the County of Cook to submit a no cash bid to acquire a tax certificate purchased for the non-payment of taxes on a certain parcel of property. This parcel of property, a vacant property, is on the south side of 123rd Street, almost uh, directly across the street uh, from the village of Peter Rock. Uh, it is up for the tax sale for 2018 property taxes. Uh, this is one of two properties that comprise uh, the former Palis Realty uh, property. Uh, it's, it's only a 50 by 113 uh, foot parcel and it's located 50 feet off the corner of 82nd and 123rd Street. Um, the other parcel of property was previously purchased uh, at a scavenger sale. Uh, to a private pro uh, party. Uh, the uh, county does have a uh, no cash bid program that the village has utilized in the past. Uh, we have acquired parcels of property on Route 83 near the 86 Avenue Trailhead uh, and uh, uh, have not done anything with those as of yet, uh, but those could be put to use in, in the future. Uh, this particular parcel of property is found uh, in the, uh, is identified in section four of the village's comprehensive plan, which is uh, called the commercial areas plan. Uh, subject parcel is part of the East 123rd Street <coughs> corridor, and the plan states the East 123rd Street corridor area provides unique access that can serve as a foundation for the consideration of appropriate commercial development. <coughs> Uh, the village uh, council uh, approves this resolution. Uh, the village could be aligned to uh, receive this parcel or it could put into play at the appropriate time uh, for commercial development. Uh, this no cash bid is a uh, <coughs> no cash, so those would not come out of pocket for it. It would, in essence, take it off for the, the property tax rolls for the, for the time being until it was uh, reutilized. Uh, the village would acquire it as an open space uh, for, for the time being. Uh, again, the, the village council felt it appropriate. Um, so this starts the process. Uh, there has to be another uh, sale. Uh, there has to be the 2018 taxes uh, have to be offered for sale twice. Uh, so we're a little bit ahead of it, but uh, we want to be in line uh, should that fail uh, to receive this parcel of property again. Um, put it to play uh, at the appropriate time uh, for the appropriate use of the village uh, sees fit. Questions? No, I just have a, a comment. The uh, actions proposed to me this evening would be consistent with those that's contemplated in the comprehensive plan. I don't see a downside to this. I would recommend its adoption in this time. I'd second that. That being the case, I'm going to make a motion to adopt, to approve resolution 2021-R-09, resolution requesting and authorizing the County of Cook to submit a no cash bid to acquire a tax certificate of purchase for the non-payment of taxes on a certain property, south side of 123rd Street, 50 feet east of 82nd Avenue, and 
Thank you all and good evening. Be safe out there. 